Dr. Venkateshwaran, the South Zone uh, President of an Infectious Disease Chapter. And, and most importantly, all my pediatricians, my fellow pediatricians from Tamil Nadu. Thank you so much for kind invitations. So unresponsive organisms in office practice. So that's the topic. Okay. So you know that antibiotics are the gift of the mankind. Key weapon for the survival of the mankind is antibiotics. But at the same time, it's a double-edged weapon. So use and throw culture leads to alarming consequences. So you know that only 13 class till 1980 and only four class of antibiotics after that, not very much. So you have to use it when you are in need. But I would like to say that you have to keep it in our locker as in the case of our precious ornaments for reuse. No compromise on optimization of antibiotic dose, duration, and for that matter, anything. So whenever possible, before you start antibiotics, do take culture before we start an antibiotics. For example, CSF culture, urine culture, blood cultures, cultures in various cultures in a few, various cultures in few with the rashes, either maybe induced saline or gastric aspirate or culture from a procured tissue sample. For example, BAL or gene export, you have to do all those things. And then practice one antibiotics in more than 85% of scenarios, whether it is in the OP practice or in IP practice. And two antibiotics in at least 10% only. And more than two antibiotics, only less than 10% cases. Okay, and immunocompetent host, watchful waiting in children with the fever if there is no definite evidence. But immunocompromised host, aggressive antibiotic administration, there is no doubt about that. But you have to practice antibiotic cycling, cycling in ICUs and PSU. So with this introduction, let us go to some of the case scenarios. So my first question to you is to Dr. Shija. So this is a case scenario of a four-year-old male child, thriving very well, high fever 103. He complains of dysuria. Not sure about the stream of the urine. So I, I used to say to my uh, mothers that when they come for review in the newborn period, they have to come out with a video of the urination. So male children, we can't go and verify whether the stream is good or not. Suppose they come out with a video of the urinary, urinary stream. It's very easy for us to know whether the whether child is having a poor stream or not. He, he, in this case, puzzles numerous. Child was started on cot trimoxol. Time of from 10 milligram per kg per day at 27 day. But the parent, the parents themselves stop treatment after five days uh, as the child is be asymptomatic. Dr. Shija, your thoughts? Whether did we earn the management? Whether uh, anything wrong in the management? Dr. Shija? Uh, yes, sir. first of all, good evening. And uh, thank you, the uh, Tamil Nadu team, for giving us this opportunity. So coming to the topic, what the sir has posted the case. So we are having here a four-year-old uh, boy who is having high fever and probably a UTI because he's symptomatic, he has a dysuria and puzzles are plenty. So an empirical antibiotic is definitely warranted in this case. But what we have not looked into is we haven't confirmed the diagnosis. We haven't sent the urine for culture. Unless we send it for culture, we would not know what antibiotics the patient is sensitive to, whether our empirical antibiotic was right, whether we need to change. So that part we haven't done. We haven't looked into the predisposing factors or the etiology or the probable cause why the child developed a urinary tract infection regarding his urinary stream. On examination, did you get the kidneys palpable? Where there was there a renal angle tenderness? Is there a constipation? All those, any spinal abnormalities, any previous history of UTI, all that are important. And the third and the most important is regarding the counseling, regarding prognosis, that is how long you have to treat and what are the complications that you're anticipating. So all these three parts are important in any child who's presenting to you with a urinary tract infection. So Dr. CJ is very clear. First of all, you have to confirm the diagnosis for their culture and sensitivity is very mandatory. So you have to look for anorectal anomalies, bladder is listened or not, she has told the constipation percent or not, dribbling percent or not, uh, nephromagaly percent or not. And also you want to say about something about tight phimosis. Isn't like that? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, then. and poor urinary streams and spine. We also have to look because child baby is having some uh, spinal problem, spinal dysrhythmism that also has to be. Looked. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Shija. And the story continues. Readmitted, the same child readmitted after 10 days due to high fever and vomiting. Child is very toxic, and we found that child is in persistent pyuria. And urine culture result E. coli resistant to cotrimoxol, cephalexin, and uh, cefotaxin. And quinolone is sensitive. What next? What's the, uh, I want to know about what's the short term management, what, what is the best method for collecting urine for culture and sensitivity, and do you want to image these children? Okay, 
so coming to the first question, that is, what is your short term management? So now we have a child who has now come back with a complicated UTI because he's having high fever, he's having vomiting, he's toxic. So from an ordinary UTI, he has moved on to become a complicated UTI. So definitely the child requires admission, proper hydration, supportive care, and also a parenteral antibiotic. Now the parenteral antibiotic. That means he needs admission. He needs yes, admission. Yes, he definitely needs it. This child will definitely need admission. And this time, definitely, we are going to take the urine, send it for culture and sensitivity, start him initially. Uh, but we already have the culture report telling about the sensitivity pattern. But whatever it is, the babe, child requires admission, child requires per parenteral antibiotic. The next is the correct dosage of antibiotic. And we have to see that it is not mandatory that you are going to give the antibiotic for the whole duration. That means you require treatment at least for 10 days, may extend up, uh, up to 14 days, depending upon the clinical scenario. But initial two to three days, IV is mandatory. After that, when the child is febrile and the child is improving, you can definitely change it to oral antibiotic for the completion of the course. The next is, do you want to send a repeat culture? A repeat culture definitely is not mandatory. But if after 72 hours of appropriate therapy, the child is not showing response, the child remains febrile and child is toxic, then a repeat culture is needed. Then how do you want to take the culture? Now, this is a four-year-old child. You can definitely take a midstream clean catch urine, uh, culture can be taken. Even a catheterization to obtain a sample can also be done. So what about uh, ultrasound to get it, uh, uh, superfluid aspiration for collecting urine for culture and sensitivity? In Kota Medical College, you know, the each and every patients, they used to do like that. Superfluid aspiration for urine uh, culture and sensitivity. It can be done, but personally, I wouldn't advise because we are really moving away from less and less of invasion. So if you are a clean catch, urine sample is giving you as well information. In this scenario, I wouldn't really like to go for a suprapubic puncture. It okay. can be done. Definitely, it can be done. And it's more sensitive. The colony count will be more sensitive from a suprapubic aspiration rather than from a midstream. But I would personally still go for a midstream or a clean catch or a catheterization sample. Dr. Shija says even though it's a gold standard or a platinum standard, she prefers a clean yeah. catch uh, specimen rather than the gold standard or pl platinum standard. So what about the imaging strategy? Imaging, all this, uh, yeah. uh, this child definitely is a complicated UT. Otherwise also, the child definitely requires an ultrasound abdomen to look for the kidney size, any perinephric uh, um, collections, any hydronephrosis. That part is mandatory. And subsequently, he also needs a DMSA scan. And if any of these are abnormal, that is, if you find something abnormal in the ultrasound or you find something abnormal in the DMSA, you will require an MCU. Otherwise, routine MCU is not needed. And the timing would be, you need to do a DMSA two to three months later and not in the acute stage, whereas ultrasound should be done while the child is admitted in the hospital in the acute stage itself. And MCU, if needed, that is after two to three weeks of antibiotic completion and that too usually are um, uh, with the antibiotic coverage also. Could you please elaborate once more about this uh, imaging procedures? Imaging procedure basically depends upon the age of the child. So if you have a UTI, your decision what imaging to do, in fact, depends upon the age of the child. So if the child is less than one year, uh, the latest, the 2021 uh, guidelines by the IAP recommends all the three. That is, you need to do an ultrasound, you need to do an MCU as well as a DMSA scan. We all know that that is a little bit of a controversial topic because most of the Western guidelines have now moved away from MCU for children less than one year, telling that only if the other two are abnormal or if the child is uh, very sick or not responding to your antibiotic, those children need only go for MCU. For, but for the time being, IAP sticks on to the guideline that less than one year, all the three needs to be done. That is because most of our children may not come back for follow-up or our counseling might be inappropriate. We may be missing cases and antenatal ultrasound is not a routine for all the babies. Taking all that into account, IAP sticks to that. All the three imaging modalities should be done for less than one year with a UTI because they are a high risk population. When it comes to children between one to five years, what is recommended is you have to do an ultrasound as well as a DMSA scan. If anything is abnormal, then you go ahead and do an MCU. For children who are more than five years, only an ultrasound is recommended and the other needs to be done if the MC, uh, if ultrasound is abnormal. If a patient comes to you with a recurrent UTI, the patient definitely requires a DMSA as well as an MC. So it's very clear. It's three, two, one. Three, three in less than one year, two in one to five years, and, and one in more than five years. It's quite clear. And uh, anyway, image is a must in a culture-proved 
you do not attract infections in children. Okay, that's good. Thank you so much. My question is resistance common with the uh, urinary pathogens and what could we do to prevent resistance in ESBL producing organisms in general and in particular in urinary tract infection and what are the antibodies you like to start empirically in most of the patients with the urinary tract infection and how common is ESBL enterococci and uh, once you prove that how will you treat this infection so this ESBL organisms so and last question whether child need prophylactic antibiotics in view a lot of questions uh, <laughs> could you please uh, answer all these questions so that I'll repeat if you want Okay, we'll go one by one. And that okay. is uh, resistance common in urinary pathogens. Yes, definitely. Resistance is common in urinary pathogens. But um, and we saw in this case also. Okay. Yeah, we saw in this case also. And it's quite common, in fact. And But only difference is that you need to know your local antibiogram because hospital differences may be there, city differences may be there. So there is a lot, even from India, the different studies that are coming from different parts of India say different percentage of resistance. So you need to know the local antibiogram to decide on that, what antibiotics you need to give. But definitely we need to understand that urinary pathogens do show resistance. So this particular study, in fact, is from uh, the Northeast, where you can see that the resistance of ceftriaxone is very, very low, just 2 percentage. Whereas the next study is from South India, and you can see the resistance is quite high. It is close to 50 percentage. So there is a regional variation, and we need to be aware of that. The second question is, what, would, uh, what could we do to prevent resistance in ESBL producing organisms in general and in urinary infections in particular? So the most important thing is, please do not give antibiotics for asymptomatic bacteriuria. The second is, when you have a bacteriuria, see whether it is symptomatic and always uh, confirm it with a culture because every pyuria is not urinary tract infection. It may be part of a systemic infection. So we need to differentiate between the two. When you have <coughs> in children and you have catheterized, ensure that the catheterization is done in the most uh, sterile manner and try to remove the catheter as soon as possible. Here again, a catheterized patient having a urine culture positivity does not mean that the child requires a treatment because it may be just a biofilm. Removing the catheter may be curative. Unless it is symptomatic, you don't need a treatment there. And when you are finally treating the child with UTI, see to it that you're sticking on to the proper antibiotic, the proper duration, and the proper dose. So that is important. And in your hospital, when you have ESBL organism or resistant organisms, always follow all the contact precautions known to see that it is not spreading from one child to another. So that is also very important. Then La last question is whether these children need prophylactic antibiotics and how long you have to give this prophylactic antibiotics? Okay, prophylactic antibiotic uh, duration or this thing will depend upon what is the grade of VUR. If you have grade one or two VUR and your child is less than one year old, you need to give prophylaxis till one year of age. But otherwise, it is uh, prophylactic um, antibiotics are recommended only for children um, uh, with higher grades. That is grade three to five only, you need to give prophylaxis and that is only up to five years of age. So um, prophylaxis for VUR depends upon the grade of VUR. So it's quite clear as Dr. Shija has correctly said, you know that pyuria is pustles more than five per hyperfield in 10 ml centrifuge urine and more than 10 per cubic millimeter in uncentrifuge urine. And as she said correctly, so all cases of pyuria are not due to urinary tract infection. You have pyuria in nephritis, you have pyuria, sterile pyuria in Kawasaki disease. All these are not urinary tract infection. Thank you, Dr. Shija, for your wonderful explanation. Now the question is, uh, and my message is that confirm urinary tract infection children with the fever with or without focus, irrespective of the gender by culture and sensitivity. Stand advert by antibiotics even before the culture results are available. You can't wait for the culture results, but you have to take the culture before you start antibiotics. Image all, adhere to the antibiotics, dose and duration. Prophylactic depends upon the severity of the VUR as told by Dr. Shija. And counseling is a must in urinary tract infection. So you have to advise them to prevent further episodes of urinary tract infections, especially. I would like, I would like to suggest to my patients that uh, Squatting maturation that empties the bladder completely, prevent constipation. So, and then, so these are some of the important advice that you have to give to male children and see the stream of the urine and also wash from front to back in females. So, sterile hygienic practice is very important. Squatting maturation, do a lot of things, and, uh, and you have to correct uh, phimosis especially tight phimosis in all children with a urinary tract infection. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shija. Now, and 
Other important thing is that ESB is E. coli is on the right. Higher mortality and longer hospital stay due to CSB log concepts. Reduce the clinical microbiological response when compared with infections that do not produce ESBL. You can slow the spread of the ESBL by barrier protection, as she said earlier, and restriction of third generation cephalosporins. Okay. Now the question is to Dr. Uh, another scenario, I want to say that is a this is a case that happened before the COVID pandemic. That means somewhere in June. Uh, and uh, this patient came in from uh, returning from Mumbai. So admitted due to 12 days to fever. This is to Dr. Naaman Nathan. Please listen. Yeah. Abdominal yes, pain, sir. vomiting, loose stools, and occasional cough. Both he hepatitis phlegmagal is, is there. Vital stable, pickle normal. Protein investigation showed leukopenia, thrombocytopenia. Right now we heard from Dr. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Sir, about this look, uh, thrombocytopenia. Dengue combo negative. Perifer smear non-contributory, EBV IgM negative, equally positive. Chest X-ray, Mando, urine, urine with the normal limits. Typhoid OT is positive and Vidal 1 in 320, awaiting the results of blood culture. So, one second. So, so for this child, you know, the start, start on ciprofloxacin in 20 milligram per kg per day as a beta dosage, but high spiking fever continued irrespective of the antibiotic even after seven days. Used it down to roll out cholecystitis, but this is normal. Blood culture grown, heavy growth of salmonella, enteric typhi, and resistant to quinolones. So my question, have you come across similar situations in your clinical practice, Dr. Nathan? Yes, sir, of course. Okay. And yeah. could, you, could yeah. you please elaborate? Why, do, why does this happen, uh, this uh, resistance to antibiotics? So quinolones, the, this patient is sensitive, they are started on quinolones. And what is the reason for this uh, failure of this antibiotics? Is it because of a resistance that has developed? And what is the reason for that? Yeah, probably uh, the, uh, with the history, if you are uh, the child coming from Mumbai, Mumbai is a place where, uh, where the antibiotics, particularly quinolones, are used left and right. So the highest uh, resistance to quinolones happened in Mumbai. So it is the capital of uh, quinolone resistance. So it's uh, the reason is the wrong empirical choice of, uh, of the uh, quinolone. Of is not there in the group. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, probably it happens. We need to be very, very selective in choosing empirical antibiotic. And of course, quinolones does not come as an empirical therapy. It's a restricted use drug. So the basic problem is misuse of drug. Yeah. So that means the wrong antibiotics they have selected and wrong dose and wrong duration. Is it like that? Yeah, oh, it's okay. right. Okay, yeah. then. Ah. So misuse of antibiotics is the reason for this uh, occurrence of us. Thank you, Dr. Nathan. So the question is, uh, okay. So can you predict the drug resistance in salmonella enterica typhi and enterica paratyphi infection? So what's the Yeah, answer? definitely, definitely. Most of the time what happens is in the culture report, the report says quinolone that is ciprofloxacin sensitive. But when you try in the patient, the patient may not respond as in this case with seven days of quinolones and adequate dose, the fever doesn't come down. It's because uh, in vitro it will be sensitive, in vivo it will not be sensitive. Another important thing is, most of the labs, they do not use this naldesic acid disc in the antibiotic uh, uh, panel. So what says is it's ciprofloxacin sensitive, but in the true case, what we need to do is, we need to do either naldesic acid or a pfloxacin disc, and then see for as a quinolone surrogate marker. If naldesic acid resistance is there, you should not use ciprofloxacin, even though if ciprofloxacin sensitivity is reported there in the research. So message is you have to look for analytic acid sensitivity rather than looking at the pro sensitivity. So you have to look for this uh, uh, sensitivity. Okay, and this. Yeah. Okay, then. So what's the short? What's the short term plan for this child? The shorter, uh, shorter plan is to stop uh, the flow. Okay. The first thing, mm. the moment you see the child, and then look at the antibiotic. Uh, a pattern, see for the best sensitive antibiotic. I'm sure ceftriaxone will pop the list. In that case, I will start at the dose of 50 to 75 milligram per kg uh, per day in a two divided doses. 
So that's message is clear. Sir, sir is saying that I need not start 100 per kg. Most of the people start 100 per kg straight away for any infections. So he wants only 50 to 75 per kg depending upon the sensitivity or the dose that he prefers. Okay, 100 per kg is not needed for uh, uh, this type of infections. Okay, thank you, sir. And then the question is that, uh, okay, this problem. So this antibody was changed to subtraction for this patient, 50 milligram per kg per day. So that was the only sensitive drug. Even the temperature subsided within 48 hours after starting the subtraction, the fever occurred. At this time, you know that they have done an MRI straight away, and that showed uh, evidence of osteomyelitis in the left femoral head. So subtraction hiked to 100 per kg per day and continued monitoring of the CRP, and, but the child responded very well after this uh, uh, increase in the dose of subtraction to 100 per kg per day, and that they have given for it a longer duration, uh, around four weeks, based upon the CRP. Okay, then my question to you is that, uh, so how do you come across similar problems in your practice uh, when you manage children with enteric fever? Of course, many a times I have seen such a similar situation. Basically, typhoid is otherwise called as enteric fever. The name itself is a misnomer. Actually, enteric fever is not uh, related to enteric alone typhoid. It's a multi-system disease. So, you expect, naturally, you expect uh, any uh, complications arise, arising from any system, from head to foot, from CNS to bone and joint. Any system, it can cause uh, complications. And this complication of uh, uh, osteomyelitis, I would, in such a case, I would look for any hemoglobinopathy, particularly sickle cell, or take a history of uh, past uh, bone marrow injury, bone injury, or a joint surgery, or a local fracture, or an immunosuppressive disorder that can uh, lead to such situation. And most of the time, it happens in the long end of, uh, in the end of long bone. So uh, having diagnosed this one, I will definitely go for, a, as, as done earlier, I'll go for sequential antibiotic therapy. Sequential antibiotic therapy is changing from uh, subtrioxone from 50 milligrams to 100 milligrams uh, per day and then to monitor the child clinically based on the fever, uh, pain, <clears throat> and uh, clinical symptoms, and also monitoring the child was by CRP and ESR. If everything goes on well, gradually I'll taper from IV to oral, uh, and then I'll maintain the child on uh, four to six weeks of antibiotics. So here you will take to give subproduxin rather than suffixin. Is it like this, sir? Yeah, subproduction yeah. will be a better choice in bone and joint rather than subproduction. Sir, it's very clear because he is uh, very familiar with this hemoglobinopathy in sickle cell. He may, he may be getting patients from tribal population in uh, Palakkad district, uh, uh, Attapadi region. Here, sickle cell anemia is very common in Kerala, in that part of the Kerala. And also, you have to look for other complications in the CNS, pulmonary, cardiac, GAT. So, each and every organ may be affected in case of salmonella infections. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, so he said he will continue with the subtraction. He will make use of this uh, uh, antibiotics based upon the CRP level. So how will you prevent salmonella infection in the community, in a method? Because we, we, are, we should be ashamed that we have salmonella typhi in the community. So we are trying to eradicate measles, but salmonella typhi is a bad disease. It's a shame for the, our country if children are having typhoid fever. Yeah, 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 I do agree, sir. Uh, Basically, prevention is aimed at the three levels, at community level, at individual level, at, through vaccination. At community level, definitely we need to educate the public about uh, boiling water and taking. Most of the time, it is uh, uh, yeah, the corporation has to take up uh, central coordination and uh, uh, safe, portable drinking water. It's, uh, it's a part of the government to produce, provide that. At individual level, uh, we have to educate our patients, particularly to avoid street food, particularly the ice cream. When coming to ice creams, most of the time, particularly during school holidays, during April, May vacation, we do find lots of outbreaks of uh, salmonella following ice cream intake because uh, these ice cream chambers, this ILR, where the ice cream is kept, salmonella type organism can thrive for nearly 30 days. So ice cream is a source of salmonella type and cut fruits that are not clean, unco uncooked uh, food, street side, and uh, tracing out food handlers and carriers and treating them is very, very important. And uh, the lastly, coming to vaccination, all of you are aware, you have this uh, typhoid conjugate vaccine that is given from six months of age. It's a wonderful vaccine. IAP has taken it up. 
and other vaccine is ty21a oral vaccine it's but a mutant variant sir is it available right now because yeah not, that's not available earlier not it was available, available in india so now, now it, but we are using only tc conjugate typhoid vaccination the only vaccine that's available in our country yeah Ah, sir, sir, sir is very clear in the sense that the prevention, he said central chlorination is very important. So you have to use municipal water supply where there is chlorination. Suppose if you take well water, so in, in, people in Kerala are very intelligent then they used to take from well water. In that process, they will get an infection because that is not chlorinated. If possible, take chlorinated water from the municipal water supply or corporation water supply. So that's the message that you have to give rather uh, than well water. So that is not chlorinated. There is chance for infection, especially when they share the, the bucket. Okay. Uh, okay. So, what is the resistance pattern in salmonella infections in your state, Doctor Nimanathan? Truly speaking, ciprofloxacin resistant is a pan-India resistant. Not only in Tamil Nadu, everywhere state. it is there. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And Tamil Nadu, one of the topping the list. And in Coimbatore, we do see lots of majority, nearly 80% of the cases are ciprofloxacin resistant. And, uh, and uh, ampicillin chloropenical resistance is uh, sensitivity is slowly gaining back. It's, uh, it's becoming more sensitive. And ciprofloxacin resistant, particularly in Tamil Nadu, is practically zero cost. So ESB producing enterobacteria is salmonella is quite high. And as a result, you are preferring to use ceftriaxone rather than ciprofloxacin or chloramphenicol or ampicillin. Your choice is yeah. ceftriaxone. So do you have to use any other, any, if patient is resistant to ceftriaxone also, what will you do, sir? So in those cases, I will choose azithromycin 10 to 20 milligram per kg weight per day. High dose. Mm. For a, yeah, yeah, for a, for a period of seven days. And if you, there is a, a allergy to uh, cephalosporin, I'll use astronam. It's not meropenum, it's astronam. Okay. So that means, uh, uh, so you have resistance against uh, quinolones, you have resistance against ampicillin, chloramphenicol, so you have multi-drug resistant salmonella typhi, and you have extensively drug resistance including subtraxone, and where you have the choice is azithromycin. I am very, I fear that even Pakistan, even azithromycin is also resistant to, sal uh, to uh, this uh, against salmonella infection. So new name is salmonella typhi enrica. Enrica Taifi. So, what about that patients coming from uh, Pakistan? What is the choice? <laughs> Pakistan Which, people. Fortunately, nobody is coming from Pakistan and to India. Uh, uh. Unfortunately, people don't come to India. Even uh. if they come, we have to be very careful because it's almost pan resistant. They are resistant to all drugs. In those cases, as per evidence, we need to start on ofloxin 15 milligram per kg per day for a period of 14 days. Uh, or you can use once again. <laughs> They are sensitive to uh, septrioxone at a dose of around 60 milligram and septrioxone at dose of 80 milligram per kg weight, you can try. If they are fluoroquinolone resistant, as indicated by naldesic acid, you can use acetromycin. Okay, thank you so much. So, my dear friends, see how to uh, see that resistance is quite high against salmonella. So, you have multi drug resistant salmonella and also extensively drug resistant salmonella and even resistance to acetromycin also has been reported. And you should be very careful uh, uh, in see, uh, seeing this resistance. And most importantly, prevention is better. You have to immunize all of it, all the children against salmonella type from six months of age onwards. And as Sar said, only single dose is sufficient. So in, tell people to vaccinate against salmonella typhi. Okay, thank you so much. Next question to Dr. Bala. Yes, sir. So this is a case scenario, a two-year-old child vaccinated as per national immunization schedule. That means they have not taken uh, this, uh, what do you call, uh, hepatitis A or uh, conjugated democratic vaccinations or other uh, various cell. So they have taken only uh, this uh, uh, Pendavac, OPV, Rotavac and MR only. And then fever 104, no, only URI symptoms, incessant crying. That was shown to be pediatrician, he diagnosed acute arteries media, bilateral. And unfortunately, he was turned on cephic sign and 10 per kg per day for five days. Even after five, three days, antibiotics uh, fever didn't subside. And in fact, discharge from the ear, from bilateral and discharge from both ear. And, but at the same time, they were irritable, irritability and fever reduced. So what are the thoughts, yeah. this, uh, Dr. Bala? Uh, first of all, let me thank our uh, organizing team of uh, IAP Tamil Nadu chapter and the ID chapter of Tamil Nadu and our Vice President Nagaraj sir and uh, my friend Nag Narmada for giving me an opportunity to be part of the Tamil Nadu CME. 
So in this case, we have a two-year-old child with on national immunization schedule, where we all know that uh, two vaccines are lacking to prevent acute arthritis media. That is one is a, a booster dose of Haemophilus influenza and the uh, pneumococcal PCV13. The pandemic uh, they have taken. They have not taken booster dose. They have not taken booster uh, dose of yeah. influenza. Booster dose is not not, 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 not loaded. So, uh, so with this uh, immunization in mind, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, the practitioner has uh, diagnosed as uh, acute arthritis media. It is not wrong, but still, uh, when a child comes with uh, incessant cry. Uh, it may not be always acute arthritis media unless you do the unless you do the autoscope. And uh, uh, here the uh, organisms commonly seen with the acute arthritis media is Pneumococcus, H. influenza, Moraxella. That is the most common organisms affecting the uh, acute arthritis media. But other organisms like Group A Streptococcus and the gram negative organisms can also cause arthritis media, especially in newborns in the uh, in <coughs> IPS settings. In uh, CSOM, Pseudomonas and Staphorias are more common. And in developing countries, we get uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. And of course, viruses part of all diseases and mycoplasma. So, Dr. Bala, so what, case, what about the choice of antibiotic that he has selected? He has, select, he has so selected Cipixic. Hmm. Yes, sir, I'm going, coming to it. In this case, pneumococcus, it's influenza, Moraxel as a common answer. So everybody knows the amoxicillin is the drug of choice. So in this case, Cipixim has started. And uh, it's, there's a general saying that uh, Cepixim is for all infections below the diaphragm. And so uh, in this case, antibody choice also is wrong. In, uh, and otitis media, this condition, the spectrum of disease where you get um, um, otitis media, otitis media with effusion and the CSOI. And uh, uh, this tympanic membrane, you can see the tympanic membrane as second, a one, double. One, one, one second, one second. Yeah. Next slide. You can see this picture, a dull, lusterless picture of normal demanding membrane on autoscope. And uh, uh, and uh, if it is acute media, you will get an epithematous bulging. And uh, in the last picture, you can see the perforation if, there is, uh, if, the, if it is not properly treated. So, uh, so in this case, the diagnosis may be correct, but uh, the antibiotic choice is wrong. So that is why the... Um, and and for a two-year-old child, he has started antibiotic and day one it is reasonable because uh, bilateral, uh, bilateral, tell us. Uh, yeah, it's, it's bilateral. Also. So uh, the reason for starting early antibiotic, according to the AAP, American Academy of uh, American Academy, is that uh, most of the pathogens causing acute arthritis media is the bacteria, and the two is uh, it will prevent separative complications like perforation and symptomatic improvement uh, resolution is far better. So what IAP guidelines say. Uh, if only the child is sick with fever more than 100 and around 100, uh, high fever with um, um, severe pain, then we can start antibiotic uh, in more than two years. Uh, otherwise, we can wait for 24 to 40 hours before starting the antibiotic. And so, most of us start amoxicillin. IAP recommends amoxicillin rather than uh, cefixime or some other drugs. First line is amoxicillin. Uh, amoxicillin is the only the difference is the dosage uh, and between AAP and IAP. We have we haven't got according to IAP we don't have much uh, resistance to pneumococcal uh, this thing. So yeah, it is not there. 50 milligram per kg per day is enough, and but uh, AAP says it is 80 to 90 milligram per kg per day. And uh, we most of us use uh, amoxicillin randomly, but in, in this case uh, the three indications for starting amoxicillin is uh, one is uh, if you are used amoxicillin or any other antibiotic within 30 days last one month, or if the child presents with the conjunctivitis and uh, um, uh, along with the otitis media, the chance for uh, um, beta, this uh, H influenza is more, at least you can start amoxicillin or child pressing chemophrolaxis, which is not given nowadays uh, for recurrent otitis media. So, so what, always what, diagnose. Well, always, one second. After the use of this Pendavac, the H influenza is not a very, very is a very rare cause for otitis media because most of the people have been vaccinated against H uh, influenza by this Pendavac. So it's not yeah. coming to the picture at all. Okay. Yeah, 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 and uh, uh, always use an autoscope, uh, even if not a pneumatic autoscope, for diagnosing otitis media. So the, the postgraduate should have an autoscope with them. And, yeah, and there should be the follow up on day three and day ten. Okay. Day ten, we have to do the uh, impedance audiometry to rule out the um, um, uh, serous otitis media, which may be asymptomatic. Okay, and uh, next, uh, then. Story continues. Tell continues to high high speaking fevers and he was admitted in another hospital. 
the CRP elevated, CBC counts more than 20,000, blood and urine cultures taken, and child was started on injection subtraction 75 per kg per day. And fever subsided, stopped antibiotics due to financial reasons and got discharged. They have received only one dose of subtraction. And uh, one month later, they again consulted first pediatrician with the uh, uh, bilateral non resolving discharge from both ears. So, what are the thoughts, of Dr. Bala, at this time? See the story. So, they have treated the treatment first with cefixim, then the subtraction, and after first dose, one dose, they are stopped. And then after one month, they have bilateral purulent uh, discharge from both ears. Yeah. Uh, here in this case, this child had uh, has not the previous slide, sir. Okay. This case, in this case, the child had nodes uh, that uh, perforation. That perforation has not healed. Child is having the non-resolving discharge from the last one month. From the history, what we can see uh, see is that the bilateral non-resolving discharge for the last one month. So more chances of uh, uh, unresolved arthritis media because CSOM uh, there should be uh, more than six should be more than six weeks. Uh, so it may be either unresolved arthritis media or recurrent arthritis media. And uh, uh, CSOM occurs when it is partially treated or inadequately treated. And as in this case, where you get a perforation of the tympanic membrane with the tympanic sclerosis and a traction pocket in the tympanic membrane, and there will be chronic infection of the mastoid, mastoid as well as the middle ear. And this unsatisfactory response uh, may be due to the poor compliance as the, um, in this case, if they all may be intercurrent infection or persistent ET, uh, ulceration to dysfunction, reinfection, or uh, impaired host defense. And uh, repeat admission, in this case, repeat admission in a month uh, can be due to organisms like pneumococcus or MRSA. And also, this child has not given uh, PCV, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. So, more likely to be a streptococcal. Uh, new, uh, new vaccine. So, so that's, that, that's a strong possibility because child has is humanized asked for the NIS schedule you know, only and child has not taken vaccine against step pneumo. So my question to you is that is it due to resistance or the complications of otitis media? What's the management strategy in acute otitis media? How will you prevent acute otitis media? Is it possible to prevent? And what's the management strategy in chronic otitis media? So do you have any suggestions to prevent hearing MBM? You know that uh, frequent otitis media can lead on to conduct hearing loss. So could you please elaborate? Yes, sir. So this uh, may, this is not a resistance case, but uh, because there is no uh, proper treatment, the child has taken because of the financial constraints. This is a complication of otitis media. As you all know, otitis media is a very common the age group, six months to 24 months, where uh, it's a spectrum disease, where you get acute uh, otitis media uh, middle effusion, and then you go into CSOM. And here, uh, the acute complications are the perforation or maybe brain abscess, abdominal emblema, all neurological complications, non-acute complications like uh, chronic perforation, otitis media with effusion, adhesive otitis media, cholesterol and otic hypocephalus. And most, even though most of the uh, um, uh, effusion results spontaneously, 25% can last more than three months and 10% can last more than one year. In such cases, you should always uh, look for speech, language, hearing problems, uh, because this is a, a chronic problem. They will not, uh, since if the child is asymptomatic, they will not go for an expert of opinion from an ENT uh, uh, physician. So speech, language, hearing problems, balance disturbance, and behavioral problems can occur with the long-standing conditions of otitis media. So what's your acute management? Yeah. Uh, so the second question is about the management of otitis media. Yeah. So pain relief is very important. Uh, you can use uh, a paracetamol, uh, and in some situations, you can use uh, brufen, uh, ibuprofen. So, are you, do you prefer uh, ibuprofen or NSA? No. It is in COVID season also, Dr. Bala. Condition, when there is an epidemic condition, or maybe in after June, July, in our state, I don't think uh, we should use brufen. But uh, some somewhat healthy conditions like the March, April, uh, there is no harm in using ibuprofen uh, properly. And you can use uh, uh, benzocaine uh, anesthetic uh, uh, ear drops and always use ear plugs to prevent entry of water uh, into the ear. And the antibiotic of choice, so after the pain relief, uh, antibiotic, everybody knows antibiotic is a drug of choice. And uh, uh, there is uh, some difference between IAP and AAP. So uh, regarding the dosage only, the less than six months always start empirically on antibiotic if the child presents with the uh, incessant cry. And uh, if you use otoscope, it's better. And between six months to 24 months, if the child is toxic and with high fever or talgia, um, up to, uh, we have to start uh, antibiotic definitely. And up to two years, antibiotics should be given for 10 days, two to six years, seven days, and after six years, maybe five to seven days. Always re review the child on day three and day 10 to roll out 
ിംഗ് <laughs> it's better to do a rapport and the surgeon and get a rhinotomy done a small incision 1 mm on the inferior quadrant of the tympanic membrane that will, that will relieve the pain uh, definitely tympanicotomy is indicated in acute cases okay then uh, how will you prevent this uh, otitis media is it possible yeah um, otitis media can be prevented uh, you all know that 90% of the cases are due to the uh, viral infection it's so like especially in that the you can't prevent nowadays uh, all both the parents are doing uh, are going for job and the child will end up in daycare center from year 1 onwards so the uh, the, ch- the children be after the age of 1 year more chance for getting viral infection and predisposing to the uh, uh, otitis media so prevent uh, daycare settings and second is the vaccination um, now go you should always go for a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and as the said uh, hemophilus influenza three doses are taken better to take the booster dose at one and a half years also to get a complete protection and uh, promote bfhi that breastfeeding uh, is very important the immunoglobulins and bnt cells in the breast uh, in the breast milk and the non immune factors like interferon and glycoprotein all will help in uh, uh, preventing otitis media and the oligosaccharides in the milk will block the pathogen entering into the mucosa and in the uh, passive smoking regarding passive smoking uh this uh, <clears throat> global cell hyperplasia occurs and uh, there is uh, uh, mucociliary transport will be affected and uh, the protein on uh, biomechanical marker uh, in uh, regarding uh, acute otitis uh, passive smoking and association with passive smoking and acute otitis uh, is increased in um, uh, passive uh, children affected with otitis media due to passive smoking and always specify as we even though we don't use much but in foreign countries we, they use specifiers and uh, in our place also breast, uh, bottle feeding uh, in supine position uh, that has to be uh, discouraged so the message things. is quite cl- ah, yeah message is quite clear so you have to give a vaccine whether it's a 10 valent uh, serof synflorex or nemocil or a 13 valent uh, pcb13 or prevenar it's very important that all of your children should be vaccinated against strep pneumo and promote breastfeeding and avoid passive smoking and and bala is seconds using pacifiers and super in bottle feeding thank you so much bala uh, and now so then what about the chronic csim do you have any suggestions yeah uh, chronic uh, csim the drug of, uh, always start with uh, uh, auto topicals like uh, chloroquinones or better to uh, combine with a steroid which has got a better effect and uh, systemic antibiotic only if there is systemic symptoms or if there is failure of uh, autotopicals or if there is child is not cooperating with the autotopicals you can use systemic antibiotic after oral choice you have to clean the um, ear and then send for culture and sensitivity also there is no role for otherwise there is no role for antibiotics but uh, antihistamines steroids decongestants vecolytics and intranasal steroids uh, you can do meringotomy and insertion of grommet tube um uh, if there is recurrent otitis media like three episodes in six months or four episodes in one year with the last one episode within the last six months uh, and also the one indication is the hearing loss of more than 40 decibels when you do the impedance audiometry if you get the hearing loss of more than 40 decibels then you have to do and uh, tympano mastoidectomy is a, a surgery if there is complication like uh, mastoiditis and other neuro that's in csym that's in csym yeah yeah i'm talking about csym and uh, adenoidectomy if there is recurrent airway obstructions uh, especially and uh, obstruction and it's better to avoid in submucous cleft palates um, otherwise you can do adenoidectomy it give uh, some protection and uh, lastly the uh, antibiotic levofloxacin in case, some case of refractory otitis media when you suspect uh, uh, um, when the all other antibiotics fail you can use levofloxacin and uh, vancomycin and metrodos also sometimes may be useful in the practice So you are doing systemic antibiotics only if the child is having toxicity. If suppose the child is in uh, CSOM and then suddenly child become toxic, then you may administer yeah. systemic okay, antibiotics. Okay, having systemic symptoms and child is okay. toxic. Okay, fine. Uh, 
so then okay that you have told uh, then next one is uh, so previous slides okay what about hearing loss uh, in this uh, condition so the uh, prevent you strategy to prevent hearing loss strategy is to prevent the hearing impairment as you all know the otitis media can, with effusion can produce hearing loss conductive or uh, sensory neural and average loss is around 27 decibels even though 15 to up to 40 and more than 40 is an indication for meningotomy and tympanic perforation will have agromatory insertion and tympanic membrane perforation will have 20 percent loss in hearing which will heal uh, without any sequelae. So acute arteries media can also produce 20% hearing loss, which will recover up once the uh, uh, tympanic member is healed. And arteries media, the effusion can produce up to 35% uh, hearing loss. So normative insertion will definitely uh, relieve the hearing impairment. And uh, uh, as a preventive strategy is related to the arteries media, um, Various preventive strategies are the uh, adenoidal hypertrophy. You have to do the adenoidectomy. As in this previous slide, I've shown a boy with a typical adenoid species. Uh, and uh, there, there are a lot of associations uh, with uh, yes, uh, this uh, CSOM. This allergic rhinitis can uh, can occur in association where you can have to use the inhaled nasal spray. Antihistamine anti use has to be sterile. Uh, early diagnosis of otitis media with early antibiotic uh, uh, I've given three reasons for starting early early antibiotics and properly and timely insertion of gamma tube or meningotomy and uh, vaccination. Also, I said earlier, and BFHI to encourage and stop passive smoking, uh, which is very common nowadays in our family. And in general, what we have to uh, uh, in general to prevent hearing impairment, uh, always do a as a newborn screening program OAE uh, and uh, and neonatal jaundice has to be uh, between two. Hypothyroidism has to be uh, ruled out, and the any any newborn with a prolonged NICU stay, uh, we have to be very careful with uh, uh, screening the hearing. So I and, think that uh, most of the hospitals now OAE is there, and uh, all children Kerala are getting this have, benefit. Yeah, Kerala we have declared uh, um, hearing friendly, hearing friendly last year, and all the hospital delivery points we are doing the OAE, uh, irrespective whether it is government or private. And the uh, thanks to Dr. Abraham, Abraham Kepol. And uh, language delay also, a child with a language delay, dysmorphism or chromosomal anomalies, we have to do the screening for, uh, to prevent hearing impairment. So what about Dr. Nemadhan, what about Tamil Nadu, whether all children are getting OAE, they are all newborns, babies are benefited by OAE, are, are they getting that? Dr. Nemadhan, please, are you there? Okay. We, we are yet to start uh, all treatment, all newborn OAE, sir, but in private hospitals we have started. Okay, government hospital is not there. So that's sad yeah. that we are in Kerala still not getting the benefit. Okay, next one. Next, next one, please. Okay, then, uh, so. So message. The message is quite clear. Uh, message is quite clear. No oral antibiotics in CSM unless it is toxic. No head bath for minimum four weeks. No saline nasal drops. No ear drops. Look for other airway issues and uh, treat adenoids and other possibilities for eustachian tube block. So, friends, we had we had th we discussed three cases. First one is uh, ESBL producing E. coli. Second one is ESBL producing salmonella, and the last one is not due to resistance, but actually due to the improper use of antibiotics and lack of vaccination. Now the question is to Dr. Shija Sugun and another case scenario. Very interesting. Twelve-year-old child, fever, nasal congestion, myalgia, June 2019, respiratory 30 per minute, saturation 92. CRT less than two seconds. Vaccinated again here also with as per the national immunization schedule. Vital stable, pickle normal, CBC is leukopenia and thrombocytopenia. Not thrombocytopenia, sorry. And dengue combo negative. But you know, that also time we were started because it is season, uh, monsoon season, uh, and also this uh, thinking that is uh, influenza. Also time we were started empirically. Leukopenia, no thrombocytopenia, discordant is there. Then uh, also time it was started. Fever 102 degree, no organomegaly, no manager signs, system review within system review within normal limits. Your thoughts. So this is what we see here is a 12-year-old child. And what are the main things that we are seeing is that the child has respiratory symptoms, he's hypoxic, but otherwise the vitals are stable. Along with that, he has some systemic symptoms like nasal congestion, myalgia there is leukopenia without thrombocytopenia. So what are the possibilities that we are looking at? We are probably looking at a community acquired pneumonia. 
it can be that they have started uh, oseltamer. Yes, a viral pneumonia is a possibility, taking into fact that he has a nasal congestion and also hypoxia. So viral pneumonia is a possibility. A secondary bacterial infection, especially with the streptococcal pneumonia, is a possibility. Then uh, you can have a systemic infection. Especially a child is not vaccinated they can step pneumococcus by. Uh. Uh, so pneumococcus is a possibility. Then you can also have a 12-year-old child, so definitely mycoplasma is also a possibility. And then finally, definitely do not uh, rule out a systemic infection, like they have already ruled, uh, ruled out dengue, but uh, respiratory signs are quite common in left toe also. So that also should be there in the back of the mind, but left toe usually does not manifest with uh, leukopenia. It usually presents with leukocytosis. So that could be an initial differential diagnosis when you're seeing this child at this point. So any chance for staph infections if the patient is deteriorating, Dr. Shija, if, if it's an influenza, Staph infections after an influenza is a possibility, but right now when I'm seeing this child, I wouldn't really think of a staph infection. Okay. I would think of a uh, staph only if uh, you have a toxic child, you okay. have a skin or soft tissue infection, you have localized effusions, I would be more in favor of that. Otherwise, a 12 year old child coming in this scenario, I wouldn't be really jumping into clock, uh, into a staph, staph infection. infection. So CRP for this child is 30 and in malarial parts are negative, in left eye, IgM negative, routine urine blood pressure normal, chest X-ray showed interstitial pattern, suggestive of uh, viral infections, maybe maybe mycoplasma. And injection amoxiclava started 90 per kg per day, but fever persisted. Amoxiclav changed to subtraction 75 per kg day along with the azithromycin. And fewer patterns same even after four days of subtraction and azithromycin. I'm thinking that it's staph infection. So I started uh, this child on floxacillin 200 per kg per day and along with amikacin 15 per kg per day. Your thoughts? Okay, so now we have a child, we have initially started on amoxiclav and then we have moved on to um, Mm, so already the amoxiclav was on quite high dose, 90 mg per kg per day. So usual pencil resistance should have been handled by that. But still probably thinking of a resistance, we have moved on to ceftriaxone. Then adding acetromycin, definitely a 12-year-old child coming with an interstitial pneumonia, mycoplasma is a possibility. Thinking that maybe probably acetro has been added. So till that, we are okay with the antibiotic selection at this point. But still, what is um, bothersome is after four days, the child is in fact deteriorating and not improving. And antibiotic clocks with amikacin, as I already said, I wouldn't be very much in favor for a clocks amikacin for this child, look, taking the whole clinical scenario into perspective. But high fever is persisting. That's, we cannot blame the physician because uh, yeah, already started an amoxiclav and didn't respond, then he changed the septraxone and then azithromycin, but still fever is persisting. And he might have thought so, that it's a staph is a uh, strong possibility. In fact, amoxiclav would have covered an MSSC. Yeah, yeah. Septraxone also would have covered an MSSC. If you're really looking at a staph, then we're probably looking at an MRSC. MRSC and then yeah. you would have gone for vancomycin in that but, state. But interstitial pneumonia, without a respect. Yeah, Dr. Shija, if patient from community, MRSA is a possibility? Yes, MRSA is a possibility. It's not yeah. that it is not a possibility because in our hospital, we are getting around 15 to 20% cases of staph are MRSA. So definitely MRSA is a possibility, but thinking of the other round, 85% are MSSC. So I would like to give emphasis on the 85% MSSC. Anyway, rather this than child was on Proxacillin and Amikacin, and then what happened? Let us see. Okay. And then, and at this point of time, multiple PCR for nasopharyngeal staph for common respiratory virus and atypic organisms negative for influenza, but positive for mycoplasma. The result came. And also, time I will stop because it is a mycoplasma pneumonia. X ray not suggestive of staph pneumonia, as you said correctly. Irregular fever persisting, general condition, okay, uh, improved. Not worsened. General condition not, not worsened. Okay. And then. My question is that, but the patient is not improving irrespective of this uh, uh, change in the antibodies that you have made. Mycopla so mycoplasma definitely is a possibility. 12 year old child presenting with pneumonia along with uh, pneumococci, we definitely always will be thinking about mycoplasma. And regarding the choice of antibiotic for mycoplasma, there is a little bit of a problem there because azithromycin resistance is being increasingly reported. In fact, many studies are now telling that azithromycin sensitivity of mycoplasma is less than 10%. You have come across so similar situations. A, you had a similar experience. You yes, had similar we had experience. in fact multiple cases. In fact, there was a period last year in between, we were getting multiple children uh, with mycoplasma. Is it due to left and right case. use of azithromycin in the clinical yeah, practice? Yeah, must be because azithro is such a commonly used drug for almost everything from URI to LRI to you uh, for um, autoritis okay, media. Everything, everything. seems to be given. Anything, anything and everything, azithromycin. Azithromycin. One reason so is good compliance. 
good come yeah, and because that once time. daily short Ila, duration three, so three patients days, are happy. everybody is happy okay then when will you suspect mycoplasma infection so classically we are taught to think about mycoplasma when you are getting a school going child and he has got an interstitial pneumonia and uh, he uh, the sympt- uh, the symptoms are less and the signs are more that is you say uh, walking pneumonia but i would say that it is not like that the three x rays that are shown they are all proven mycoplasma pcr positive cases subsequently antibody also positive and as you can see here they are presenting with lobar pneumonia so mycoplasma no we used to call it as an atypical pneumonia because it used to produce a more interstitial pattern but nowadays we are definitely coming across mycoplasma pneumonia which are lobar which has effusion many times hemorrhagic and effusions and when you have systemic symptoms definitely think of mycoplasma if you have a thromboembolic compli- complication one of our child had a pulmonary thrombosis another child had a peripheral thrombosis some patients have uh, anemia along with that bct positive anemia so when you have a systemic symptoms also think about mycoplasma oxygen hopefully people are telling that if a patient is in covid 19 and if they have mycoplasma infection there is more chance for thrombosis and more chance for complication is it true covid 19 yeah. as such is a pro thrombotic uh, condition yeah. and mycoplasma also often precipitates a thrombosis so whether both together are additive uh, we'll have to wait and see it's okay, a possibility then. definitely uh, my question is that as you said correctly my why our patient didn't respond to azithromycin because we have started the antibiotic uh, along with uh, but patient didn't respond that must be the resistance to azithromycin okay, because okay. resistance to azithromycin for mycoplasma is quite common and what is really sensitive to mycoplasma now is mainly the quinolones so ofloxacin is and so, doxycycline is also a good alternative the good news for you ofloxacin at 10 per kg and the child became effable within 48 hours okay so okay. the message is quite clear so you have to manage the approach pneumonia systematically based on age of his bacteriological pattern as suggested by iap resistance to pneumonia is rare in our continent but it is there especially when there is you are suspecting a step pneumonia you have to cover uh, antibody that uh, can penetrate into the csf maybe vancomycin be cautious so best since uh, resistance is uh, 33% in against tmb smx and 20 to 25% tetracycline and quinolones 2 percentage strep pneumonia resistance is just is as a fact now as said earlier but mrsa is very common in hospitalized children as said correctly by dr uh, shija adults and mycoplasma is a possibility you would consider mycoplasma when children are having infections widespread use of macrolides has resulted in resistance ranging from 50 to 95% against this mycoplasma so in case of mrsa the newer antibiotics are vancomycin daptomycin lenasol tedisolid delfa delfo oxacin quinolone derivative is a quinolone derivative omadacycline ceftriolin and ceftobiprol and new one, one are dalbavanacin and oritavanacin and telivanacin this are against mrsa so now the question is to dr nemenathan so this is a live case only a old boy from balisheri that's near kolkod even is for age had high fever tachycardia muffling of the heart sounds clinical diagnosis of myocarditis was made and child was managed with the ivag and other supportive measures and child was referred from this uh, periphery hospital to gmc code code a general condition was not at all satisfactory two days later child had bloody stool initially there was no bloody stool sibling of the child also had similar story bloody stool other systems were normal means vital uh, tachycardia bp 100 by 70 54 respiratory 26 fecal non contributory there is alteration of sensorium and gat showed some dehydration and cbc leukocytosis crp is 200 troponin was elevated your routine exam should be normal limits blood culture urine culture taken motion culture sent and injection ciprofloxacin was started 20 mg per kg body weight and cardiac status improved your thoughts uh, dr nemenath yeah uh, this is a 12 year old child coming from uh, kolikot uh, an endemic area for uh, lots of parental diseases Uh, coming with a history of bloody stools myocarditis altered sensorium with a similar illness in the sibling with the elevated total count uh, it will uh, swing the pendulum towards enteropathogen particularly i will group them into six enteropathogens the topmost in the list i will keep shigella in mind 
because sigla is an organism wherein two persons in the same family having at the same time because even a minimal of 10 organisms can infect both person and and, uh, and also colicod there was an outbreak of shigellosis recently epidemic of shigellosis probably recently and also next organism will be i'll keep it in the mind is salmonella is the close mimic of shigella and other four organisms are campylobacter and enterotoxic e coli and of course in the list i'll have clostridium and amebiasis with a parvovirus in my mind why the parvovirus it is less likely yes. and amebiasis also as per the icmr study the incidence in children is very less less than 3% and uh, clostridium difficile usually it happens after a long course of antibiotics that's also ruled out campylobacter and enterotoxigenic e coli in this situation could be a possibility but keep them in the last in the list so my view will be focus on shigella and salmonella sir so your priorities are shigella salmonella is seen enterocolitis campylobacter jejuni and uh, enterohemorrhagic e coli is it like that yeah okay so motion culture report came shigella sonia arsenic and lots and the body has changed to septraxon uh, sorry your time is up actually it's okay, already sir. fighted yeah oh, how many more minutes sir already you crossed three minutes sir. oh my god then i will stop <laughs> with this case sorry okay uh, okay, okay sir and uh, then doc uh, and the body has changed to septraxon general condition worsen general uh, child develop seizures and child succumbed sir name another uh, sir sir. Uh, sir okay so uh, what and yeah. we do like to suggest in this case uh, we have sat on cipro yeah. yeah probably this is a child with uh, a toxic lethal toxic encephalopathy or ekeri syndrome probably this type of antibiotic resistance is very common particularly it is the antibiotic resistance in shigella is multifactorial innate acquired and adaptive and uh, nowadays we see lots of children particularly there is around uh, resistance to ampicillin and uh, other uh, antibiotics to the tune of 70% and ciprofloxacin uh, like salmonella the resistance is nearly very high so it be, it is not wise to start ciprofloxacin uh, as an empirical antibiotic even in shigella so we had two cases of ciprofloxacin resistance one initial case it was uh, for salmonella and now it's for shigella and cipro is resistant so you won't give any other drugs like this uh, lamotil or loperamide and uh, you may preserve but you would like to start azithromycin which antibiotic you will start for this patient yeah preferably astromycin little higher dose uh, so that seems to be on the day one it's 12 mg per kg weight followed by astromycin 6 mg per kg weight for next four days so any other drug that you would like to start for this patient other than this yeah, uh, of course cefixim at 8 mg per kg weight per day or naldesic acid 55 mg per kg per day in four different doses okay but naldesic acid is similar to that of uh, this ciprofloxacin but uh, can you do you want yeah. to start yeah then brush feeding and hand washing okay then uh one second okay then high rate of resistance to shigella fluoroquinolones 20 to 30% are resistant to shigella azithro and sr so is all these antibodies are resistant to shigella so antibody selection by antibiotic susceptible testing options fluoroquinolone azithro ceftriaxone cefixim dmp etc okay then so whether uh, is there a time for is there a time because we have one more case to be discussed that will take a little more time that is a case of a, a multi drug resistant uh, tuberculosis dr sudagar uh, sir al- sorry already we are running okay, late then so let us, uh, it's a very big program sir okay, big, okay. okay thank you so much sir i am i will summarize and then uh, okay it's big slide uh, dr sorry but dr bala bala oh it's okay sir sorry that i couldn't take your case uh, because we uh, uh, because we'll we'll keep at mdr tuberculosis a separate right. session another day sir. separate session so we'll give you a chance to dr bala okay. definitely we'll invite him for that okay so last one last slide last slide one second last one next one next one next one sir that case you Actually, one second, one second, one second. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Make it fast. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. So we're going to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This one. 
so my dear friends at the end i would like to conclude the, uh, my this uh, panel discussion uh, with the statements that antibiotics are life saving antibiotics are not anti pyretics antibiotics has to be preserved for future generation and also you have to prevent esb producing enterococcal species prevent mdr xdr salmonella prevent mrs resistant streptomyces resistant mycoplasma prevent shigella and prevent mdr xdr tb next slide please there are some questions in the I will, chat I, I would like to thank uh, iap tamil nadu id chapter and also my panelists dr nemanathan dr balajinder and dr shija sugunan so they were very kind to me in cooperating their answers were fantastic and uh, any questions uh, doc, and uh, finally dr okay. narmada also yeah. and also all the organizers of this meeting so there are some questions but most of them i think bala and shreya madam had answered uh, one thing is like a uh, three months old infant uh, the urine culture has shown e coli twice uh, where, and there is asb and carbapenem resistant and sensitive to colistin and nitrofurantoin the child is having no pus cells would you treat this child and if so with what antibiotics dr shreya what's your answer this is the question dr shreya okay. can you yeah. hear me yeah i can hear you yeah. yeah 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 so yeah that's a very interesting question and very relevant too you have a small baby three month old who does not have pyuria so that is a problem here because you are getting a culture which is showing esbl and that too you, so you are mm, uh, the sensitivity given is a higher antibiotic so your decision whether to treat or not depends on whether you think it is a uti or not so how do we decide that so you for you uh, for whenever we get a culture positivity a urine microscopy should reveal either pyuria or bacteria so earlier teaching was without pyuria bacteria is, doesn't make sense but now it is either pyuria or bacteria for so urine microscopy you should get either pus cells there or you should get bacteria or both either way so if one of those is positive then the culture definitely has significance even in the absence of pus cells and culture has significance if the child is symptomatic so that is also important the child was admitted with fever and vomiting and by the time you get the culture and the child is okay there is no need for you to go for the higher antibiotic because always in vivo presentation is more important than in vitro sensitivity so go for sp urine there is no doubt about this uh, contamination this <laughs> is a small child sir that is yes, a four year old small child, child or big child you can safely do this sp urine yeah, what i used to do sp urine left and right with uh, and uh, we will get uh, even if one parcel is present uh, even if the colony count is less than 100000 you quite sure that's uti if it is uh, is, is suprapubic aspiration of the urine ஒர்க்கிங்ஸ் most of the time in vitro the antibiotics will be sensitive and they may not be available in vivo that's the most problem another important thing is you have to ask your lab person to include p flocks in this in the in the antibiotic uh, antibiogram so if you include a p flocks in this if it gives a sensitivity pattern you can use in such situation you can use uh, uh, quinolones particularly you can use the higher quinolones most of the time they will be sensitive there was a question about dexa in uh, typhoid yes, higher dose yeah. what is the question yeah. that, what is the question that the question all, all antibodies are sensitive but the child had complications yes like sir yeah, not responding so, so you have to investigate the patient see whether the child is having a focus so whether so the same thing happened in our case you know that child was responding but they have started antibodies but in respect to that child was fever was there and when they can mri that showed osteomyelitis that we won't pick okay. up usually so only you have to investigate this patient you have to investigate the patient detail if they are running fever so now we have facilities it does not necessary as when they don't have any facility now we can investigate the patient and see whether the child is any focus present or not yeah regarding the dexa regarding the dexa if the patient is in shock in in a typhoid fever if there is a delirium augmentation stupor and coma uh, first we need to rule out a bacterial meningitis by doing a cs of analysis bacterial meningitis is not the you are advised to start dexamethasone at the dose of 3 mg per kg iv given over 30 minutes followed by 1 mg per kg given every 6 hours for a total of 8 hours 8 doses sorry 8 doses the fatality in the dexa arm is uh, around 10% whereas in the non dexa arm is nearly 55% so 
so you can reduce the mortality by using dexa okay yes. uh, i think we'll stop it with here so there are such still certain question dr bala has answered almost all his questions in the chat box so if there is any question left i would really request the uh, panelists to answer thank you so much for sir, sir, uh, regarding the, the, the i want to put one point actually this is nothing to do with the uh, discussion but to make a clarity in the public that there are about the oae and bara in tamil nadu there is 32 centers are doing oae in bara monthly more than 12000 newborn babies are been screened for oae every month in and there are a lot of cochlear in, in transplantation just for the sharing the information for the public in, in government hospitals or in private in hospitals? Government, hospital government hospitals through the district early oh, intervention there are that's 32 good. district early intervention centers i know that i heard that tamil nadu uh, government is giving uh, pneumococcal vaccination free of course yes pneumococcal yes, vaccine less than 2 kg all the newborn babies oh, are great. getting pneumococcal kerala it is not there in kerala it is not there So that's yes, sir. Really, really, See, really month, that's why I want to convey the message that monthly twelve thousand to fifteen thousand newborn babies are being screened for OAE as well as Bara. If needed, if not, that's good. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah we are also.